Welcome to this evening's uh, session on competency. Uh, if you want to ask questions as we go along, please put your hand up on the screen and we'll ask it then. Um, and if you put your name in the chat, we'll send a, a certificate out for you. And the session, as you see, has been recorded already. Okay. Right. So first question, who thinks they're competent? So if you just put your hand up on the, the screen, if you would, just to... Uh, Who think who's got the hand up? Anybody hand up? No hands at the moment, so that means you're not. Don't think you're competent then. I don't believe you're not competent. Do think you're competent, Stephen? <laughs> Depends on what on, on your job. On on the <laughs> that's true. Yes. <laughs> okay. Right. So what? Who thinks competent? Let's move that off the screen there. Okay. So hopefully everything's a competent doing their job. Um, who's up to date with the CPD? That's the other question. Um, please know that obviously you'll get a CPD certificate for this session. Um, and generally speaking, to maintain maintenance of competency, you should be doing 24-1 hours a year. Um, that's obviously you know, half an hour a week, so it's not that bonus at all. But the main thing is to record it. I assume you're all on SIBSI members. If you're not a SIBSI member, you can still record it on a spreadsheet. And remember that the CPE can be structured, uh, unstructured, or semi structured. The session we're doing this evening is our classes are semi structured. Somebody else in the lobby? Uh, it's, that's a semi structured because there's no assessment at the end of it. So basically, the unstructured is the self learning, the self study. Um, remote learning. The semi-structured is when you attend CPD sessions, um, informal ones on presentations, and the structure is when there's actually a, a professional le lecture or a, a an assessment at the end of it. So that's the thing about Bill, the competency is how to, do, how to demonstrate you've actually got it without actually doing anything apart from recording what you're doing already. So why do we need to demonstrate competency? What's it all about? Why do you say the one with competence in? Well, the competence you're looking at is in your particular discipline or or subject you're you're working in. Um, the Building Safety Act came in in, in last year, April two thousand and twenty-three, and that basically has put a whole different emphasis on competency. It's um, obviously high risk buildings, but well, building competence on the um, sorry, anyway. Just give me give me a second. Right, yeah. On the uh, building safety act, the two roles of principal designer and principal contractor are totally different to the CDM designated roles for these particular jobs. The principal designer actually signs the design off when you start and signs you off at completion. So if you're involved in any part of that process, the principal designer is looking for you to actually verify what you've done and be able to demonstrate what you've done is, is complete and correct and compliant. So it's got a whole different emphasis on, um, you know, taking part in projects. And we were on the higher risk buildings. This came to force in October last year. As, as we were probably aware, any residential building more than seven storeys or over 18 metres to the top occupy floor, a building which gains at least two residential units, a care home or a hospital. Interestingly, not hotels, but well, that's obviously you know, their thought process was uh, different to ours. But the hotels aren't high-risk buildings because they're probably manned all the time. Basically, if you're working on a high-risk building, you will need to demonstrate your competence, not just in we said before about that your discipline, but in working on those buildings, you know, and um, the, without the, uh, there will be a licensing system coming in, as I understand it, which will be from April next year. The uh, building control people are going through the process at the moment, as they obviously have to be part of this process. So demonstration of competence, the theoretical and practical problem solving the existing and new technology. Again, think about it on your own uh, subject or discipline. You know, this is something you should be able to 
demonstrates you know that the, you can actually think about a problem and actually apply a practical solution to it. Something that we do every day of the week without thinking about it, but it's something that uh, is something that will be a demonstration of real competence. And we'll go into onto shortly how that is uh, recorded and uh, measured. A new technology, existing a new technology. How easy is it to just stick with it, what you know? Well, we used it last project, it worked. How about looking at stuff that's coming along that hasn't been tried before? That's the the, the where the demonstration of competence comes. And again, it's um, a part of doing your know, job and having it, making it more interesting. Remembering, of course, that new technology can, of course, be a part of your CPD or one of your applications for a, a professional certification. Accountability for project finance and personnel management. Again, if you're thinking, I, I do that. I do that. Great. That was it sets you in, in good stead for you know demonstrating your competence or, or getting the certification to demonstrate your competence. So accountability for project finance, personal management. So you've got people working for you. Hopefully you've got some personal personal management, personnel management. And if you're running a project, you will have financial restraints on you. If you're not, you've got to think about this in your future career, that will become part of your scope. It happens. People get promoted, and then now any technical profession, they get promoted into a managerial position, managing staff. Sets skill sets to develop other technical staff. Again, we all think we can do it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be told people how to do it, but it's, a, it's certainly a, a skill to passing your knowledge on to other people, either your you know junior people or people same position as yourself if you've taken a lead on a particular project or subject you should be able to pass that knowledge on to your other peers uh, even by doing cpd sessions um, to spread that knowledge beyond your your company and again if you're thinking well i do that great stuff if you're doing it all you need to do is you know i can't say Record it or, or as your CPD, if you're doing technical stuff, passing your sessions on this. Um, and you know, bear in mind when you're coming to do some professional certification or competence. Effective interpersonal skills in communicating technical matters. Again, something we do every day of the week, uh, you know, effective interpersonal skills, talking to other people. But a tricky bit is when you're talking to clients, when you're having to not use technical language, I'm to, you know, dumb it down is a bit cruel, but certainly make it so language they understand. Or if you're talking to people who aren't as technical yourself in your own team, it you know, might be a different discipline. So it's those things. And again, if you think, great, I can do that, you're well on your way. That's, that's, that's excellent news. And understanding regulations, standards and codes, it should be a given in our technical business that you, if you're working on something, the risk of course is, is that when you stay outside your own discipline, that all of a sudden, are you competent? Do you understand the regulation standards and codes in that other discipline or that other area of work? And if you don't, then you should really make, make your knowledge either to understand, learn the regulation standards and codes, or you know, say, that's outside my skill set, I can't do it. Also, some things people are not prepared to do. They see there's been a, a failure to their boss if they say to the boss, I'm not got the experience to do that. But as you saw before, the Building Safety Act, you've got to be able to demonstrate competence. So if you make a mistake and your boss doesn't spot it, he's got as big a problem as you have. So in other words, it's, so if you're understanding regulations and standards and codes, you say, and you're saying that's you know, great, excellent. Can't that's a... Uh, Okay, then correctly that's applying those uh, regulations and standards and codes we spoke about. All, all you know, it's great to be able to know it in theory. Yes, I know all the standards and codes and all the rest of it. I can read a standard, but applying it, understanding, you know, when two perhaps when two codes conflict, which one takes precedence? You know, so again, if you if you think, well, I'm doing that already, I can do that. That's excellent news that you will stand in good stead. You know, going forward to to be able to obtain a qualification or registration to demonstrate your competence, which gives you a, a okay. So again, demonstrate your competence, obtain a recognised qualification, membership or fellowship. Sounds obvious. 
But at the end of the day, in this day and age, it's the way it works, the world. You have to, you know, you're no point saying, you know, do that, I can do that. You need to actually have the piece of paper that demonstrates you can do that. So you could be an affiliate member of recognised institutions. Hands up, who is a full member of um, of an organisation such as uh, what, uh, SIBSI or MIET? Well done, Stephen. <laughs> well done, uh, Ashley. So uh, on the other ones, if, hopefully you're working towards it, but uh, this will give you some pointers to what, what needs to be done. OK, so this base membership is an affiliate membership and it's something to encourage your staff members who have just joined the business, who are, you know, are not in a position yet to start to be working towards things, to become an affiliate member of the institutions. That way they get a lot of the member benefits um, and they can understand what they need to, to pull to progress to being a, a full member. Next one is the membership of recognised institution. Um, again, it's something that's an, it's a it's a way of demonstrating that there's something that's not fully recognised of people outside the uh, the profession that to actually become a member of SIBSI or to become a member of the I, MIET isn't something you just hand out. It's it's, it's something you have to work for. I certainly have to work for mine. You know, seven thousand word technical report route. Unless you do the the actual um, qualification route but again it's some way it's demonstrating to people so when the architect says to you i'm technical designer in this job you're doing your particular discipline what makes me convinced that you know what we're talking about and are competent and straight away that's it this is a starting point where you say well look i'm a member of this organization uh, and it, it gives you gives him confidence he can do it um and you'll have the confidence anyhow because you've obviously achieved that um that membership. An interesting quick tip for those who haven't got membership yet is that once you achieve membership of SIBSI, to get membership of the MIET is quite straightforward. It's almost a, it's like a, a similar qualification. So it's always worth when you've got the MSIBSI, apply to the uh, MIET and um, there's a good chance to be able to obtain the membership of the organisation and pay the appropriate fee, as these things always are. Uh, but again, it's a way of uh, broaden your knowledge and also you're, you're demonstrating your experience that you're not just a, a one trick pony of one organisation, you've gone to other ones as well, you know, the MIET. A fellowship of recognised institutions, so once you become a fellow a member, member, obviously the likes of Joss, you then can work towards being a fellow. Again, the, the requirements for a fellow are similar to a membership, but there's more of a, a management, more of a new technology aspect to it. Um, I'm working on my fellowship at the moment, and it's, it is quite difficult doing it alongside your day job. But again, it is a way of demonstrating your, your knowledge of the subject. And interestingly, like member and like fellow, it's actually is a, a SIBSI qualification, uh, not a particular discipline. You know, so it's, it's, it means you're in building services. Uh, it doesn't mean, for example, in my case, uh, lift engineering. It just means I'm a you know, qualified in SIBSI or as a, a, a member. Uh, so in some ways, it's, it's not as strong as a, a particular discipline. And sort of particular disciplines, obtaining a, an engineering degree, a BSc or MSc, is obviously a, a surefire way of demonstrating it. Just to temper that, though, of course, you go along to your architect and you're in your, your 40s, 50s and say, yeah, I've got my degree. And the architect says, well, when did you get that? When I was 23. So all of a sudden that could be 20 years ago. And the guy said, Lang about, how do I know you're up to date with your modern technology? How do I know you understand the codes and regulations? And he doesn't. You know, so in other words, that's where your CPD comes into it to be able to demonstrate you've kept up to date, up to date in the meantime. And then you've got professional registration with the Engineering Council uh, as the, the the blue blue flag type of a qualification. And starting with the um, Engineering Technician, EngTech, again, the qualification to get that is very much practically based. It's actually what you're doing, you know, on the hand, on, on always hands on, not obviously on the tools, but certainly design wise. You're not expected to demonstrate uh, leadership. You're not expected to demonstrate innovation. 
but it's a good starting point um, for it. And the same with the uh, incorporated engineer, ING, is a bit more up from the engineering. So that's something else in the window, and uh, some just relative rating there. So it's a, a step up from the previous one, but it's way of also having to understand some of the uh, the managerial aspects and the new technology. And then the, the blue flag one, the Chartered Engineer CNG, is where you're expected to demonstrate your knowledge of new technology, application of new technology, um, leadership skills, budgeting controls, people management, you know, and it's one of those things that it's, uh, you build up towards it. You should not, um, to go straight into it, uh, a younger person would be quite difficult unless they do the, uh, the actual the route. Which we'll go on to next. So which one should I go do? Engineering technician, corporate engineer, or the um, the chartered engineer? Well, basically, if you're looking at the grade you're going in at, you're looking at um, basically at the associate is the, the incorporated engineer is the sort of the equivalent thing you'd be going for there. Um, and if you're going, if you remember already, then the chartered engineer will be a one would be working towards a lot of the competencies you need to be a member are those competencies that are need to demonstrate to be a chartered engineer as part of it. And you'll find that the, the 17 competencies and the SIBSI guide M23 are repeated across the three areas, but in different um, grades, if you like, as I said before, we're doing the engineering technician, very much a, a hands-on thing, where you're doing the chartered engineer, you're strategically thinking, you're, you're looking at you know, the future, you're looking at applying new technology. So it's, it's a progression. And it's something that, um, you know, depending where on your, on your career path, it may be a different one to go for. And again, it's getting those what the uh, memberships on the qualifications. Section examples of other people in your in your organisation. And just a quick one now for the say how difficult are these things to achieve. In the words of the American president, JFK or John F. Kelly for the younger attendees, we choose to go to the moon this decade. We and do the other things not because they are easy, because they are hard. Simple words, Boguire was mainly considered to be a great man. In other words, it was easy, everyone would do it. So what you're doing by doing these qualifications, memberships, is actually demonstrating you've done the hard work. You know, you're not, you know, it's um so in other words, it has a qualification as a, a value for that matter alone. So it's the end's journey. The two routes have a bachelor's degree of honours plus an appropriate and accredited master's degree in engineering doc uh, uh, engineering doctorate. Or you can do the other route, which is the technical report route. Uh, this is the route I took to get my CNG. Um, and they've all obviously got the challenges, whichever route you go. So on the, the CNG journey, if you choose to go this route, and again, it'd be similar for the, um, the ING, your first thing is to find a sponsor and a mentor. Doesn't need to work for your organisation or company, but it obviously needs to be a CNG person already. Uh, preferably, I think, with the organisation you're working towards. Obviously, a chartered engineer is registered with the Engineering Council. So, if you go by Sipsy, you're a registered organisation, you're as well getting your sponsor or mentor who is a member, a chartered engineer by Sipsy. They understand the route and the system, it helps. Um, there is support from SIPSI on the uh, mentorship. They will provide um, help with mentors and probably give you suggestions, suggestions of names. Um, so that's the first job. Now, then choose a subject. Again, it's something you've got a lot of, lot of work about, a lot of words and need to understand inside out, you know, because you're going to get interviewed on your, your report on this subject and it's a 10,000 or seven to 10,000 word report. So it's something you need to know back to front, but it's something you can learn about. Don't think, oh, I don't know enough about something. Part of the object of doing the chart engineer is you actually do do the research, you do do the investigation and the background into your subject. 
And at the end of it, you do know your subject back to front. Uh, my particular instance, it was a rigid chain lifting uh, system. That's the underside of a, a 40 ton uh, truck lift. Now those chains you see there, those vertical things are what pushes the lift up. So it's actually lift pushed up rather than lifted up. Uh, that was my particular subject. And um, this is a project I, I completed in Manchester where we've actually got two of the um, these lifts installed. The left hand one there, you'll see my favorite cursor on the screen, is got a four lift on it. And that lift is in the lower position. On this one, the right hand side is in the raised, part of the raised position. It will take lift a 40 ton articulated truck. Um, amazing system. Um, well, that was my subject. So I, I set out realizing we are a good candidate for what I wanted, and it worked. It was uh, you know, accepted as a subject, and I then wrote, I could have written more than 10,000 words. But again, you'd got to set out thinking, you know, can I write 10,000 words on it? The first thing to then is once you've chosen your subject, what should you do with your sponsor and mentor? Your, you know, your mentor is going to say, yeah, that's a good subject. You're able to write that much about it. Or you may say, no, you can't write that much, that many enough words about it. It needs to be a more technical subject or something. Uh, you know, it will guide you on what subject it should be, but it needs to be one that you agree. And this, again, is something that you can use on the your report. And then write an abstract, to, um, which is then submitted to, to SIBSI, which basically demonstrates that your project covers their requirements. And again, those requirements are set out on the SIBSI paperwork. Um, that's the next one. Then once you've got, got to that, you've got the op op approval from SIBSI for the subject. They will review your abstract and say, yeah, we can, you know, we think that's suitable. It's relevant to your discipline or what you want to do with charter engineering. Um, and, you, you know, they're comfortable that you'll be able to do it and, they, you know, and be able to have enough depth to the subject to do it. And then you'll obtain approval from SIBSI for the subject. They'll give the approval or say no. Not that that's happening, but they will say, well, choose a different subject. Then you set off and you write between seven and 10,000 words um, on the subject. Sounds daunting, but if you've got the right subject, it's not because it's just like writing a book. Um, and it has to be structured in such a way that it reads like a, a, a report. It has been referenced on references put into it, uh, which cross reference to the 17 competencies that you're looking for. So you can't just write all technical stuff. You've got to do some of the ethical policies, some on the you know, other aspects of the, the 17 competencies. Um, so you don't need your 10,000 words. And again, your mentor will be able to help you on that. You know, send the information to them to review. And then you prepare a presentation for your technical report of, of your report, which you'll take to interview. So you basically do the report, they do a presentation on it, they have a presentation, um, the PowerPoint presentation. Then you submit an update on the you update your membership competencies because uh, it, the idea is that you do your membership first before you go to, the, to apply for the uh, Chartered Engineer. These competencies, 17 competencies, are the same competencies as for your membership as they are for your Chartered Engineer. The difference being is that you will expect it to do them to a higher standard. So where you'd, on the, on the um, membership one, you might be doing managerial duties, on the chart engine, you'll be looking at strategic forward thinking. You know, again, everything is up a scale. So it's it's something the, your mentor will be able to guide you through doing. Then the technical professional interview, where you actually be interviewed using the presentation you've prepared on, on your topic, on your subject, and you're interviewed not always by people of the same discipline. Will be certainly bright bunnies who uh, from the SIBSI organization who will all interview you. And uh, when you've done all that, then hopefully you pass, which I did. I shared my chartered registration in June last year. So it's been a it's quite a challenge. Okay, the challenge of you know doing something like either like a membership or the IENG or CENG is actually finding the time to do it as well as a day job. 
So the, the top, the secret is, is to choose a subject that you're working in on a day to day basis. So you can actually pick information up for your report as you're doing your day job, but it still takes a lot of time. 10,000 words is a lot of words. And then fitting the subject to match the report criteria. If you get the wrong subject, it's very hard to shoehorn it in to you know, what you want it to do. You know, so if you get the right subject and it matches what you're looking for on the on the 17 competencies, and it's something you would say, for example, are working on or know about. And interestingly, it doesn't actually have to be something you achieve. It can still be a theoretical thing. You know, it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be, you know, I did this project and took it from inception to completion because in real world, that doesn't happen. You know, you don't get this opportunity to uh, take it all the way through. It's something that, um, you know, in theory, it sounds great, but it doesn't happen. So it's uh, been a great experience. And uh, that's a, my, the late Dr. Gina Barney was my sponsor and mentor. And luckily I managed to qualify, uh, qualify. I got the registration three weeks uh, let her know, and then she died three weeks later. Wasn't me on this, I didn't, uh, but it was, she was certainly a, a major factor. Having the right mentor, and she is one of the, was one of the leading lights in the lift engineering industry. And um, so her assistance was invaluable. Okay, so any questions?